Hello, everybody. I'm Chuck Wigger, state senator, and today I'm very pleased to have with me the Secretary of State for Minnesota, Steve Simon. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. You are elected by the voters of Minnesota, and uh, to lead this office, uh, tell us about the office of Secretary of State. And <clears throat> we all know about the importance of voting, and we're going to spend a lot of time. But just the overview, there may be a couple of things people aren't aware of as well. So Secretary of State, that office. Yes. Well, first, Senator, thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate the opportunity. Welcome. I'm blessed to be Minnesota Secretary of State. I was elected in 2014, re-elected in 2018. And if I sort of zoom out and talk about the office, by headcount, if you just look at the largest component of people in the office, it's actually not what you'd think. It's not elections. It's the business services department. Yep. So we do all the intake and all the business registrations um, for the state, as well as other related functions, whether it's uh, uniform commercial code uh, financing statements or tax liens or even notary public information, things like that. So that, by headcount, is the biggest um, part of the office. We also run a program called the Safe at Home program. Safe at yes. Home. Very important life-saving program. Safe at Home is an address confidentiality or address anonymity program for victims of domestic violence, stalking, sexual assault, and the like. And it allows participants to keep their true physical home address totally secret and private for all purposes, yes. public and private. So we take that very seriously. We allow them to live their lives um, unfound by someone they don't want to find them. So for example, we handle their mail uh, so that they can get their mail without fear of being sort of discovered. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's no secret, as you sort of hinted at, Senator, that most people, when and if they think of our office, probably associate us with elections. So I and our office serve as the chief elections administrators uh, for the state of Minnesota. Doesn't mean we count the votes, we don't doesn't mean we own a bunch of elections equipment, we don't, but we oversee the process by which the votes are counted and election judges are deployed and hired. And um, we have, I dare say, um, the best election system in the country. And I, I think a lot of people would agree with that on a bipartisan basis if you go across the country. And uh, you're involved nationally as well with other election, chief election officials. And uh, is that the bipartisan feedback that Oh, you generally get absolutely. You know, this work has to be and is bipartisan. It's really nonpartisan. It's about making sure we have clean, fair, honest elections with integrity, yes. and that we're uh, telling our folks in Minnesota to take advantage of their right to vote. I can't resist Senator putting in a plug as I always do for the second election in a row in 2018. Yes. Minnesota was number one in the country in voter turnout. We got there in 2016, got there in 2018. Now I like to joke the pressure is unbearable. Mm -hmm. Right, because we want to go for three in a row in 2020 to be number one in the country in voter turnout. And that's not an accident. Mm -hmm. The good folks of Minnesota love to vote. They always have. And anything that we can do in our office, and I know you do all the time, to foster interest in voting and making sure people yeah. take advantage of that right, all the better. Remind us again of the requirements for a person to vote. Right. Well, they're pretty basic, and they're set forth in the Minnesota Constitution. You've got to be 18 years old. Yep. You've got to be... By election day. Right, correct. Okay. But as long as on game day, on election day, you're 18, that's yes. okay. okay. So you have to be 18. You have to be a citizen of the United States. Mm -hmm. No big surprise there. You have to be a resident of Minnesota. No big surprise there. How long? And 30 days. 30 days. And you have to be... Uh, you, you, you can't be currently serving a felony sentence. Those yes. are the four. That's it. Okay. As long as you meet those, you are eligible in the state of Minnesota to vote. Okay. And approximately... How many registered voters are there? Uh, well, registered voters, we have about uh, north of three, about three and a half million, 3.2, 3.3 million voters. Okay. It always fluctuates, yep. and I'd have to check the latest numbers, but it's certainly yep. north of three. Yeah. And uh, again, we were number one in the country the last yep. two elections in a row, so a huge percentage of people voted. Okay. And is it public information? if when a person votes. Correct, yes. It's okay. all in the system um, when a person votes. Obviously not who they vote for. Yes. We have a secret ballot. But um, you can determine someone's voter history. That is public information. So you can see, hey, does this person vote you know, all the time, sometimes, just in presidential years, yep. in all the years, etc. Yeah. But obviously not who they vote for. Correct. Okay. We'll never know that. Yeah. And, and obviously, too, nobody wants election fraud and right. there you know, tell us about the safeguards mm. that are in the system you oversee a system but uh, you know it's those election judges and uh, right. hundreds of people 
that are basically volunteers or low paid uh, 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 people that are implementing the election with uh, key staff in, in the various uh, communities. But uh, what, what are the safeguards that yeah. are in place to address the potential of voter fraud? Right. Well, so obviously you always just have to take seriously the possibility that someone's yes. going to do the wrong thing. The good news in Minnesota is that thanks to laws that you and your colleagues have passed over the years, we have a lot of safeguards before the election, during the election, and after the election as well in order to counter any bad misbehavior at the polling place. In yeah. fact, some of the things we have in Minnesota are things that other states are seeking to copy. And in, and in fact, some of the proposals in Congress right now would require all states to do some of the things that Minnesota already does. For example? Well, so um, one of the things we have that makes overall fraud or lack of integrity um, tougher is that we have paper ballots. Yes. Um, uh, there's a movement in, nationally to make sure that all states have to do what Minnesota already does. So paper yes. ballots is one. But in terms of someone trying to scheme to rig an election, let's say, one of the good things about Minnesota that other states are trying to imitate is we are really decentralized. As I mentioned before, yeah. we don't, my office, we don't count a single vote. That happens in 4,000 polling places. It takes 28,000 plus election judges to put on an election. Let me just put it this way. If someone wanted to rig an election, a lot of people would have to be in on the plan. Not one or two or three or 10, a ton of people. And they're gonna get caught and they're gonna go to prison. Um, so we have safeguards from uh, you know, the, the data that we exchange with the courts, with the Department of Public Safety, um, with others to flag people who shouldn't be on the voter rolls, all the way till after the election, when we have rigorous um, post-election audits, post-election reviews, both by our office mm -hmm. and by those in the counties and cities. And let me just, for your viewers' sake, talk about what the actual numbers are. So we have a state of five and a half million people. We have millions and millions of voters. The county attorneys, I trust law enforcement, they do a great job investigating any possible tip or claim of any fraud. Yep. So we get regular reports under state law about all the convictions or prosecutions for any species of voter fraud, registration or uh, uh, voter impersonation or any species you can think of of fraud. The last report that I checked, we're gonna get another one in about a month or two here. The last report that I checked you know what the number was for the entire state of Minnesota for convictions? 11. 11 okay. people. Now that's 11 too many. Yep. We all want it to be zero. But let's put this in some rational perspective. That comes out to seven ten thousandths of 1%. Yep. That's as close to perfection as you probably can get statistically. So we always got to be on guard and we are and we work with the county attorneys and the sheriffs and law enforcement very closely. But we've got a really clean, well-run, nonpartisan system in Minnesota. Yes. And same day registration? It, Huge. And there's no move to change that anymore, I believe? I don't think so. It's okay. just become such an accepted part yes. of our culture. And that was a real game changer. Minnesota was one of the first states in 1974 yes. to have same-day voter registration. And just for your viewers' benefit, you know, most other states still to this day, they have a cutoff period. It's two yes. or three weeks before the election. And if you're not registered by mid-October or early October, you're out of luck. That's yeah. it. Yeah. In Minnesota, thank goodness, you could roll out of bed that day on election day unregistered, go to your polling place, register, and vote in one fell swoop. And that has been such a game changer the last 40 plus years. Gotcha. Um, any changes that you'd like to see made in the registration process uh, as we look at the uh, upcoming legislative session or beyond? Yes, and some of them I know you've been involved with and your colleagues have as well. And these are, again, bipartisan reforms that yes. have been tried elsewhere across the country. One that I'm really interested in is sometimes goes by the name automatic voter registration. Yes. It's not a totally accurate name, but what it would mean is that when folks go to get, for example, a driver's license, right now under current law, there's a box you can check right, right today that says when you're taking that eye chart test and doing all the rest to yeah. redo your driver's license or get it for the first time, and the box today says, hey, check here if you want to be registered to vote. All that this new law would do same eye chart test, same process, same document, only instead of checking it if you do want to be registered, it would be an opt out. You only check it if you don't want to be registered. That's okay. it. It's not a big change to what we have, but in other states that have done it, not only has it enhanced um, turnout and participation, but here's where it's truly bipartisan. It has cleaned up the voter rolls. Yeah. Because now imagine, instead of hundreds of thousands of people registering same day, now those hundreds of thousands, most of them, I would guess 80 to 90% of them, are already in the system yeah. days, weeks, or months before where you can do the filtering and screening with more yeah. time. So this is an idea whose time has come. I'm really for it. Another thing, a related thing, 
uh, that we've looked into. About 13, 14 states have it. Again, red states, blue states, totally bipartisan. It's something called pre-registration for high school students, yes. where 16 and 17 year olds would be able to put their names on the list. They're not registered yet, because you can't be registered until you're 18, but it's sort of like the, the getting in the pre-line before you're registered. They fill out all the information, we're able to do all the security checks and filters, and then boom, on their 18th birthday, they are then automatically in the system as registered voters. It's had a huge effect in states like Florida and Hawaii and a number of other states. And then the other thing I would mention is, um, just to name three that off the top of my head, are um, restoring voting rights for those who have uh, left prison behind. That's a growing bipartisan movement across the country. Yes. In Iowa, for example, uh, the governor there just made it a centerpiece of her state of the state address. In Florida, I like to tell this story, Senator, you know, Florida, some of your viewers might know, is a 50-50 state when yes. it comes to politics. In fact, in the last election, they had a recount for their governor's race and a recount in their U.S. Senate race, both at the same time, and yet this 50-50 state voted 61 percent yes on a ballot question that would do just what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so it's got widespread Democratic and Republican support. The idea is, hey, if someone's done the time for a crime that they should have their civil rights restored, certainly get a say in who governs them, and, and that, that's a growing movement. Well, these are all initiatives I support, and uh, we will eventually get there. I hope so. Them, uh, and particularly uh, where we talk for more civic awareness in high schools. Yes. And uh, a number of my colleagues have talked about that, but uh, you know, providing that access to the voter box, making it a little you know, more convenient. So yes. well, let's hope we get there. And uh, again, this should not be a partisan issue. No. Yeah. And, and in other states it isn't. There's no yeah. reason it has to be in this state. Good. Uh, in the last presidential race, there's, I guess, been quite a bit of proof about the involvement of Russia, uh, and uh, that's it could be ongoing right now, uh, or it could be other countries. Uh, I, I don't know if our country gets involved in other elections. Uh, it's scary. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts about you know, international you know, in involvement or any types of uh, ways of influencing voters? Uh, I don't know to what extent you're able to and have jurisdiction on that uh, uh, in terms of uh, internet messages, et cetera. Right. But uh, your thoughts, because it does seem to undermine fair election. Absolutely. I think the number one threat to the integrity of our elections in Minnesota and nationally is the prospect, the danger of an outside force, probably a foreign government, trying to mess with our democracy. Now, there's a couple ways they do that, and you alluded to disinformation and misinformation, yes. stirring up trouble on social media. Yes. Our office. We can use our bully pulpit there. We don't have any, you know, authority to regulate or do anything like that. But tell people to be careful news consumers on all sides, both sides of the aisle, all areas of the political spectrum. If you hear some, something that eh, sounds like it's maybe too neat and simple to be true, some yeah. conspiracy theory about your political adversary, you know, read very carefully. But where we do have jurisdiction is on the physical sort of intervention that can happen, the hacking. Uh, okay. things like that, and maintaining our election system. So just for your um, viewers' benefit, in 2016, Minnesota was one of the 21 states that was targeted yep. by the Russian government, period. That's not a, a debate. Nobody debates that. All the intel Yeah, all the yeah. intelligence authorities yeah. say that happened. The good news is, in Minnesota, we passed the test. We kept the bad guys out. Nothing happened. They targeted us, but unsuccessfully targeted us. Yeah. So that's great. Everything worked. Same in 2018. Everything worked, no problems. But it does give you pause, right, to know that someone's out there sort of gunning for your election systems. I'm talking about the, the databases, the computer systems, the things that we use to run elections. So thanks to you and your colleagues, we finally got access to a bunch of federal money this last year that's going to enable us to beef up our security even more. So we already okay. work closely with the federal intelligence authorities. We get um, confidential and secret intelligence briefings. We get threat assessments. We have them physically come to our office from Washington and do what they call penetration testing, where they basically try to hack us and find the vulnerabilities. Yes. And we just had one of the rounds of that recently. So I don't want any Minnesotan to think that they should hesitate for one moment casting a vote because they think their vote's going to get hacked. Well, the fundamentals are good in Minnesota. We've got paper ballots. We're working with the feds and the yeah. intelligence authorities. But, but, it's always a danger, and I can't sit here and responsibly say that there's a 0% chance something yeah. could happen. It's not zero. Uh, but we've really limited the risks and worked hard to do that. So we've got a very safe system, 
everything worked in 2016 and 2018 despite their efforts to get in. I expect that to be the case in 2020, but there's no guarantee. We just got to keep our eye on that ball. I always like to say, Senator, it's like a, it's like a race without a finish line. Yeah. You know, whether it's our office or the Minnesota Senate or Target or a bank, when it comes to cybersecurity, you got to stay one step ahead of the bad guys always, and you can yeah. never stop. That's it. There is no finish line. So yeah. we just got to do it. And, and through your it. national leadership uh, in, involved with the other chief election officers, yes. you're talking this is clearly on oh. the agenda. It's not only on the agenda, it is number one on the agenda. Every okay. time we meet, and twice a year all the secretaries of state meet, it is yeah. no question, nothing else comes close. The number one issue is yeah. that part of election integrity, making sure the bad guys stay out. Whether it's Russia or another government or the guy next door, we don't really care in a sense. You know, if someone's trying to get in and mess with our systems, what their motives are or where they come from yeah. is interesting, but not totally relevant. We just want to keep out the bad guys. That's it. Uh, tell us about the importance of the election judges and oh. the, the long shifts that they work Huge. and then uh, getting there early and then maybe they're, they're past midnight and I know they're always looking for help, but uh, you know, just in general, uh, I, I know there's generally going to be a need Huge. for that. So you know, tell us about that. Oh. And, I, Senator, thank you for raising that because I always say, every time I meet an election judge, past or present, I always say, thank you, thank you, thank you. We could not do this without election judges. It takes 28,000, more than that, election judges to put on an election. That's a small yeah. army. Yeah. And these folks are not doing it to get rich or for their health, you know? I mean, they do get a stipend, so folks should know that. You do get paid, uh, the, the going rate is anywhere between, oh, 10 or 15 bucks an hour, but it's a long day, as you yeah. say. You know, our, our polling places are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., but you got to come an hour too early. You got to stay probably more than an hour too late, and it is there a might long be a, day. A line that, yeah, and then you got to. That's right. Them. Okay. That's right, and you got to tally them. That's all done in the precinct, and so it's a long day, but it's a rewarding job. It's a necessary job. So if anyone's interested, they can find out more information on our website. It's mnvotes.org. mnvotes.org to find out more about where to go your county, your city, depending on where you live, um, to figure out how to do that. It's a great service, so necessary, and I should point out, totally non-political. No one's going in there wearing a you know party hat and trying to put their thumb on the scale for right. a particular party. That's why we have such a clean system in Minnesota. You've got 28,000 folks, totally non-political, in the polling places, just yeah. trying to get it right, and they do get it right. Great. Uh, tell me about your background. Uh, with your path, uh, you're a very uh, talented legislator, but uh, you know, just growing up and yeah. what brought you to your leadership role now yeah. as the chief election. Sure. Well, I still live where I grew up, which is Hopkins, Minnesota, just a suburb to the west of Minneapolis. Yes. Went to Hopkins High School, um, and um, I, I went into the law profession, went to law school, and was a lawyer both with the state at the attorney general's office and then with a law firm. Mm -hmm. And then in 2004, I ran for the legislature and won, and was there for 10 years serving alongside you and others. And the whole time I was really involved in democracy issues and voting issues and access issues. Those were things that really energized me. I saw them as connected to every other issue. Yeah. And so in 2014, I had the opportunity to run for this office. The, my predecessor was not running for reelection. Mm -hmm. So I ran and I got in. And one other just note about my background, you know, most Minnesotans, um, um, unless they're uh, uh, Native Americans or, or, or have Native American heritage, have an immigrant story in their yes. background. And mine is that my great-grandparents, I like to say they didn't just immigrate, they fled. They fled Eastern Europe um, because it was not a good place for them and their yeah. families. They faced discrimination, they faced all sorts of hardships, and they came here to Minnesota. Yeah. And one of the things they didn't have where they came from is the right to vote in free, fair, and honest elections. They didn't get a say in who got to govern them. Um, and they came here and they found a great life, and one of the parts of that great life is getting a say. Their mm -hmm. vote, their voice is their say in who governs them and how. And that's a big deal, and it's connected yeah. to every other issue. So that's me in a very quick nutshell. I, yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm married, and my wife and I like to say that we have two of each, two kids, two dogs, two cats. Okay. So. Great. And I want to mention, too, before I had ever heard of you, I had heard of your father, Ron. Oh, thanks. Um, just a very uh, talented uh, sports agent, uh, a That's lawyer, right. very mm -hmm. gifted, but uh, I remember Sid Hartman. 
yep. talking about your dad. And yep. I think uh, Sid Hartman was one of his clients, Kent Herbeck, but yep. a whole bunch of others. So I bet you've met a lot of celebrities when you were a young kid. I like to say that I had the best autograph collection in the neighborhood. Let's put it that way, when I was eight or nine years old, yeah. because we would have some of these pro athletes or gopher athletes sometimes coming to the house. So yeah, my dad, thank you for that. He just passed away last November, yeah. uh, but he led a great and long life. Uh, he had great clients like Ken Herbeck, Paul Molitor, Brad Radke of the Twins. He had uh, Scott Studwell of the Vikings, for your listeners who remember that name, Greg Coleman, the punter. He had forgetting a bunch of bunch of NHL hockey clients. But Sid Hartman was his client it's Sid too, Cli so yes. he, he even had an agent. Yeah, sometimes one. he had yes. one, right, and he had other media <laughs> clients as well, but Sid was always a, Sid Hartman, who's a character, I mean, what you see yeah. is the real Sid Hartman. That yeah. is not an act. He's this boisterous, loud guy. Yeah. He used to call our house all the time, uh, especially at dinner time, and I'd answer the phone and say, well, you know, I'm, um, we're eating dinner right now, and he said, doesn't matter, I gotta talk to your dad right away. I mean, he's just this bull in a china shop. Yeah. yeah, just like he is right now. So <laughs> that was my memory growing up, yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanna thank you so much for your leadership, and uh, we focused on the importance, the integrity for the elections, and we'll continue to do that. You're gonna meet the uh, number one status again next year. I'm Hope confident so. of that. And uh, you all mentioned too, the business services. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big part of the office for viewers with that additional interest. Again, navigate that website. And also the importance on the uh, relocation with anonymity, if you, uh, particularly if you've been a victim of abuse. That's and right. It's very important as well. So uh, all those services, uh, notary public as well, mm -hmm. that's a full plate of items. So go to the website or they can contact your office. And I believe that phone number yes. is... Yes. The phone number, the all-purpose phone number is 651-201- 1324, 651-201-1324. And for voting matters, it's mnvotes.org, mnvotes.org. And Senator, I just want to say before you sign off, I want to thank you because you through many years and particularly recently have been totally on the spot on these democracy and access issues. And I really appreciate, and I know Minnesotans appreciate your leadership. So thank you very much for all that you've done to make us, I think, the best democracy in America. Thank you very much, Secretary of State Steve Thanks, Simon. Senator. Thank you. Viewers. Thanks for watching. Contact the Secretary of State's office for any additional uh, follow-up that you would like to have, guidance, questions. Uh, I know he'd like that. And also, if you see the election judge, give him a big shout out and thank him, maybe a hug too for all they're doing. You get involved uh, to the extent that you might be able to at your local level. Our democracy depends on it. Thank you.